panel today, uh, as you probably all realize from the um, from our uh, course, is humanistic and clinical evidence. The title of this panel seems to be both critical to the work we want to be doing, but also offers, I think, a significant site of contention. Evidence and its related idea, object, as in object of inquiry or object of study, are terms that fundamentally define disciplinary practices, desires, and imperatives. What counts as evidence? How is it produced? How is it circulated? And how does it come to mean something are critical to the accounts that we offer of the world and form the basis for our different disciplinary divides. In a conference in practice like ours, when disciplines collide, the resultant perturbations, deformations, and expansions alter the forms and acceptabilities of evidence. What can humanistic studies broadly conceived do to what counts as evidence in the clinical realm between healthcare workers and patients? In what ways have the humanities reconceived their relationship to pedagogy and purpose in an encounter with physical and mental forms of suffering? Certainly, every single panel and every paper in this conference is a result of this collision and the resultant reframing of what counts both as evidence and an object of study. So now, perhaps, with the help of our speakers today, we can ask ourselves what effects these shifts will have on the future, to borrow from the last panel, of our patients, our students, and our academic practices. I'm going to begin by giving short introductions of both of our speakers. The third speaker, unfortunately, couldn't make it, Jordan Jack, but if uh, having read her paper, if any of you are interested, which some of you probably are, in the relationship between um, the production of scientific knowledge and neuroscience particularly and rhetorical forms of argumentation, it's, it's a great paper, and I'm sure you could email her and get it, and I'd encourage you to do that. So I'm going to start by introducing Barry. Barry Saunders is an associate professor in the Division of Social Medicine at UNC. His work is informed by lines different lines of training, both in medical doctoring as a general internal medicine doc and an ER doc, and in a set of humanities disciplines. He is a cultural anthropologist of contemporary biomedicine and teaching hospitals. Using approaches from philosophy, anthropology, history, and literary criticism, he considers how medicine and hospitals are, among other things, religious institutions with their own doctrines and scriptures, rituals, and priesthoods. Most of his academic writing concerns practices of scientific and clinical knowledge making. His first book, CT Suite, The Work of Diagnosis in the Age of Non-Invasive Cutting, is an ethnography and philosophical history of CT scanning. And Terence Holt, who will be our second speaker, holds faculty appointments in the Department of Social Medicine and the Division of Geriatric Medicine at UNC. Primarily a writer of short fiction, he also publishes sporadically, that's his word, not mine, on narrative medicine and other intersections of literary studies and the medical. His short fiction has been anthologized widely in the US, Europe, and Asia, and in 2009 was collected as In the Valley of the Kings, um, published by Norton in 2009, which was a New York Times editor cho editor's choice and runner-up for the 2010 Penn American Center's Robert W. Bingham Prize for Distinguished Literary Achievement. He recently completed a second collection of short stories, Internal Medicine, parts of which have appeared in Granta and the Boston Review. So I'm gonna let uh, Barry take it away. My remarks here are quite an applied form of medical humanities work. Uh, more pragmatic intervention, I think, than scholarship, although it has, I hope, some scholarly ballast. Uh, they concern the evidence talk that is everywhere in medicine and healthcare these days as both a kind of problem uh, as well as opportunity. Today I want to address one tiny cluster of that evidence talk, namely how the term evidence figures in the language games and scientific imaginaries of uh, early medical students. I'll sketch one case of a medical school's modest pedagogical intervention into these imaginaries. By modest, I mean, in part, something that still uh, feels incomplete, insufficient. I'll then say a bit about a further pedagogical project that some colleagues and I are embarked on uh, at the same medical school, UNC Chapel Hill, that will, I hope, flesh out these interventions in some helpful ways. In regard to the language games around evidence in, in medical education, medical students in their first two years are embarked on a process of memorizing scientific factoids. 
I call them factoids to signal their historicity, but they, there's no reason not to call many or most of them facts. Uh, it's just that so many of the facts will change. Students are told this. Some facts are wrong. Some are incomplete. They're also told that some are irrelevant. Here's an example of the mostly or eventually irrelevant. Uh, the minutiae of the glycolytic pathway, all medical students have to memorize it, but it will be forgotten or forgettable uh, an hour after they've sat for the USMLE Step 1 exam. But the mere fact of fact, the mere exercise of fact memorization produces and requires a kind of provisional belief, a granting of importance to slides like these. Med students arrive already plunged in sciences to varying degrees, most having at least dabbled or been apprentices at laboratory benches, not just in undergrad chemistry, but also in biological lab settings. They've had their hands on some of the tools of laboratory precision, pipettes, scales, standardized uh, test objects, calibration dials. Most are not statisticians, but have a good sense of uh, good data versus noisy or bad data through trying to find in them lines and curves and thresholds. So they know evidence is a word that points in part to method, to the patient meticulous work of producing facts about biological processes. So when in the medical school day, the early medical school day, not early in the morning, but the first couple of years, <laughs> are we most likely to hear the term evidence? This is an ethnography. These are hip pocket glib impressions. In the first two years, the so-called basic science years, it comes mostly from the lecture podium, from science teachers summarizing the state of understanding about some biological process or structure or clinical entity. It's usually the mechanisms that were elucidated relatively recently or insights afforded by new techniques or the contested insights that summon the term evidence. A fact nexus as hardened as glycolysis wouldn't likely be taught with any evidential ballast beyond its textbook representation. In the latter two years, in clinical clerkships and on the hospital wards, we begin to hear evidence in questions posed to students that are drawn from the concerns of evidence-based medicine, about justifications in the research literature for particular actions, analyses of test performance, considerations of the fit of the instant patient with a particular research population. These are clinical concerns rather than basic science concerns. Instructors do ask students about physiologic process, but not expressly under the sign of evidence. On the student side, there's also an increasing insertion of the term evidence into their recitations of patient histories and physicals. No evidence of thought disorder. No evidence of physical abuse. Here the term accomplishes an abbreviation, one phrase substituting for a list of four or five uh, potentially reportable signs. The right leg showed evidence of infection. Here we just have obfuscation, an attempt to pump up the scientistic heft of the presentation. It's like saying methodology when you really are talking about method. <clears throat> so at times, such uses of evidence can seem a bit gratuitous or fetishistic. But they do reconnect this notion of evidence to the question of observational methods, the trustworthiness of the senses. Perhaps all this was obvious from the outset, that there are differences among the evidence that supports science instructors' claim, science instructors claims about basic physiologic and pathologic method mechanisms, the evidence of uh, uh, evidence-based medicines clinical trials as summoned in clinical settings, and a sometimes scientistic usage of the term in testimony of clinical trainees and attendings, but slippages among these two. It's the scientistic bit that we fret about and set about to intervene in. Even if you don't hear the scientism, it's there. This is not a comment on the psychology or the imaginative capacities of medical students. They're an enormously diverse group, for one thing, and it doesn't do to generalize about interiorities here. This is about the knowledge regimes of the institution. So uh, about six years back, in the Medicine and Society course that is taught at UNC throughout the student's first year, we were able to insert a session on evidence that I'd been wanting to insert for a long time. Uh, I'm going to read that session to you uh, entire in a bit, but first some context. The MedSoch course has, for 30 years or so, claimed an unusually generous wedge of first-year curriculum time. It's a year-long, 28-hour uh, and 20-minute sessions in an integrated sequence 
taught weekly in parallel seminars by a multidisciplinary faculty. The faculty includes humanities scholars, social scientists, and some thoughtful clinicians and bench scientists. Everyone who leads a seminar in this course has spent a year apprenticing with a seasoned instructor first. About half of the sequence of course topics is about social and cultural uh, dimensions of illness experience, care seeking, and medical training, including determinants of health inequalities. The other half is divided between topics in ethics and topics in political economy and health system organization. The students read 20 or 30 pages a week and do several focused writing exercises over the course of the year. Each week, our faculty gets together in the hour before we fan out to our seminars to exchange ideas about the topic of the week, pedagogical devices, all that. So this session on evidence. This year, it was the 12th session in the lineup, late in the first half of the course, late in the arc of our reflections on markers of social identity and the effects of culture, an arc that included things like the storying of experience in and out of illness, varying conceptions of the sacred as they shape bodies and health, cultural variations in dying, death, and mourning. The graphics that you'll see in a bit uh, are just some of the works that are cited at places in the text. Uh, the students don't get the graphics, alas. Uh, in addition to the session introduction that I'm about to read, the students uh, are also asked to read some thir uh, 20 or 30 page chunk that's selected by their uh, seminar reader, seminar instructor, from a range of possibilities on the syllabus. So here's the session intro. Cultures of biomedicine, one, evidence and ways of knowing. Today we commence a two-week discussion of medical cultures. In this session, so I'm talking to medical students, we consider how scientific evidence, in quotes, fits into medical ways of knowing. To analyze so basic a concept as evidence is to examine assumptions, a reflexive move for you who are committed so intensely to memorizing facts. Notions of accuracy, validity, and objectivity are familiar parts of the scientific regime, but this regime is one in which you, like most clinical caregivers, are mainly consumers, only sometimes producers. This session is intended to help you be intellectually and politically savvy consumers at the outset of careers of lifelong relearning, in which best practices of clinical decision making, as well as the forms of evidence that supports them, will change continually. Next week, we will address ourselves more directly to worlds of the clinic. Evidence might seem an odd place to develop social and cultural concerns. You might assume that evidence has a kind of purity about it, that it's a direct expression of nature, precisely what is not cluttered with social and cultural agendas. Indeed, the notion that evidence is something firm, without wobble, underwrites much of the literature on evidence-based medicine, as well as the familiar expression, basic science. Evidence becomes foundation, hard facts laid together in a mortar of method, repetition, confirmation. What could society have to do with this? For one thing, such notions of evidence don't fit entirely with what scientists tell us about their own work. Scientists know well that the tools they use determine in part what they find, and tool use is everywhere a cultural phenomenon. Science is a complex cultural apparatus shaped by funding priorities of the NIH, the CDC, the Department of Defense, NSF, and beyond, and by corporate investments in new technology, often in response to the market. Other influences on what science finds and how it is done include peer review for public publication and funding, rhetorics of journal writing and other forms of persuasion that summon colleagues to particular ways of seeing things. Scientific facts in all their apparent purity and stability are propped up by a lot of cult cultural infrastructure. This does not reduce the importance of method and rigor on the lab bench and other places science is done. But this rigor is exercised on a thoroughly social landscape in which conventions, apprenticeships, the tacit kinds of knowledge, unconscious, undiscussed, that inform skills, can assume as much importance as explicit rules and protocols. Historians and philosophers of science tell related stories. Different scientific disciplines have distinctive thought styles, which change over time. Scientific controversies unfold among different labs, which compete for funds and recognition. Credibilities and reputations are secured by academic citation. Whether or not divisions and alliances in the scientific community produce what Kuhn famously called paradigms, such observations suggest that science may not simply accumulate 
or successively approximate timeless truths. In 2005, a GEM review of research findings published in several prominent journals between 2000 and 2003 makes this point in regard to clinical research. Among 45 of the most highly publicized studies, 16% were contradicted by subsequent research and another 16% superseded by replications that produced weaker results. At any given historical moment and location, what constitutes knowledge and evidence must offer some kind of fit with prevailing ways of thinking. When we speak of evidence these days in biomedicine, we often mean one of two things, measurements of something, death rates, symptoms, cell counts, lab results, that have been submitted to statistical testing, or trustworthy graphic representations, photographs, CT scans, both statistics and graphics are tools for convincing, for navigating shoals of uncertainty, ambiguity, and dispute. <clears throat> Statistical tests are particularly important <coughs> when our uncertainty has a probabilistic cast. Among other places, you'll learn about these at the beginning of your second year in the science of testing modules of your tools of diagnosis course. Confidence intervals, predictive values, likelihood ratios, etc. These are ingredient to what we now refer to as evidence-based medicine, EBM. EBM is also concerned with study design, especially for large numbers of subjects in different locations. Some kinds of studies are considered more authoritative than others. The randomized controlled trial, RCT, is exemplary here. The notion of EBM, uh, featured in several of today's resource readings, might lead you to infer that once upon a time, or somewhere out there still, there was, is, medicine that is practiced without an evidential basis. This is an oversimplification. Philosophically, this view underestimates how qualitative forms of evidence are incorporated into clinical judgment and tact. Historically, it overstates the past distance of biomedicine from quantitative methods. Today's resource reading by historian Ted Porter explains how medicine and statistical methods have been complexly twined since at least the 17th century. Nor is it the case that precise techniques of measurement and statistical methods were imported to medicine from the basic sciences. Statistics have originated in the service of state projects of social engineering and reform. Statistique meant facts about the state. And in several important measurements in medicine were adopted at first, not so much for their clinical utilities, but at the behest of life insurance companies to solve problems of insurer-client trust. Our core reading and several resource readings develop further social dimensions of quantitative, probabilistic evidence in medicine. Stuart Bloom's essay, this is the core reading, on the politics of endpoints, places technology assessments, studies of how effective technologies are for improving population health within a social frame. He shows how different national contexts with different configurations of stakeholders and priorities lead to different usage of the very same technologies, thus radically different construals of the evidence. Montgomery's essay on clinical rationality suggests that medicine's embrace of quantitative evidence is laudable, but ultimately incapable of reducing the uncertainties inherent in, in a science of individuals. The other kind of evidence you may discuss today, oh, I'm behind a slide, sorry, is visual, pictorial, graphic. Things like photographs, x-rays, and tissue slices, move the slide here, are particularly helpful in marking morphological distinctions and similarities among disease entities that can be tricky and elusive. Such pictures claim, as do graphs of automated measurements, the authority of mechanical objectivity, though this is often dependent on the authority of expert interpretation and testimony. Two of our resource readings on visual evidence are philosophical, excerpts from Sontag's On Photography and Calvino's Invisible Cities are meant to provoke your thinking about relations between visual representation and power, ownership, and control. The excerpts from Saunders' observational study of radiologists at work, sorry, um, suggest that visual knowing is inextricable from the social context in which it is learned and performed. Discussion questions. What do you make of the conventional use of the passive voice in the methods sections of scientific journal articles? The vessel was cannulated. The specimens were solubilized. What does this say about scientific agency? 
Have you encountered uh, — question two, have you encountered examples of different thought styles among different basic science disciplines? What are the sources of those differences? Three, do you think preclinical medical students are disposed to trust most of the facts they memorize? Or do they approach facts, such facts with skepticism? Would skepticism, or even detailed reflection about the social provenance of particular facts, make the facts harder or easier to memorize? Four, why is vision the master sense for medicine? Parenthetically, do you know any blind doctors? Would you have been admitted to medical school if you were blind? Five, Sontag points out how early institutional applications of photography included those of police forces. What are some similarities and differences between medicine and police work, between medical testimony and courtroom testimony? So that's, that's it for the session intro. Uh, I have to say that even after six years on the syllabus, in the syllabus, this remains a session that a few of our seminar instructors are still figuring out how to teach. At the time of its introduction to the course, it required a significant amount of unpacking and situating for a very talented uh, group of professors, but for, particularly for those who were not already familiar with uh, arguments about the social construction of knowledge. Now, I said that this intervention, this seminar session, meant to provoke students' reflection on knowing right in the middle of their variant, valiant efforts to master an insane amount of detail felt incomplete. Partly this is because it's so fleeting. This is a spoonful of how we know reflection uh, in the midst of a fire hose of uh, facts to memorize all year long. Partly this occurs in a course which, uh, despite its claim to a relatively generous wedge of curriculum time, has, I think, cordoned off the social in sort of an odd way. Medicine and society as a course runs in parallel to the big block courses in the sciences and, and another course on the how-tos of doctoring. We need these small medicine and society seminars that provide protected spaces for reflection, debate, critique. But they also serve to cocoon the social, I think. And with the exception of the session I just read to you, uh, also, um, and a few other episodes in other weeks, our precious separation also conspires in absolving the sciences from having to engage the social. The social is allowed to be primarily about the messy lives of patients and professionals or institutional contexts of access and practice. Sciences are permitted to be more pure. So we've recently launched a faculty development effort among the basic science faculty to encourage them in their teaching of scientific topics to reflect now and again on social and cultural dimensions of scientific work, their own work, that is. We hope to enable some of these basic science faculty to stop pretending that science is a system of controls fully adequate to the excommunication of the social. For others who may already allow social factors to creep into the edges of their presentation of mechanisms and structures as a kind of ornament or sidebar, we want to encourage them to consider those social factors now and again on their own terms. We want to work toward the occasional teaching of scientific work in some fuller bloom of scientific complexity. So the full Monty framing of this project is that we're working to develop an STS curriculum for the medical school. Uh, such a curriculum could not, I think, be top down. Oh, once again, I'm a slide behind. Um, that would, I think, simply reproduce a vision, a version of the science wars. Uh, that's the next slide, and we can hold on that. This would require diplomacy, uh, constructive partnerships between scientists and humanities, scientists and humanities and social science faculty. This will only work if it engages the interests of and finds a sincere welcome with the science faculty themselves. Indeed, I'd never have started work on this if I didn't already have the welcome and encouragement of several scientist colleagues in a cohort of extremely uh, open uh, science course directors. Putting this project together has to uh, unfold on a case-by-case -case basis, kind of opportunistically, with focused topical partnerships between a science faculty member and an STS-oriented consultant. Uh, as it happens now, there are six of us in the social medicine ready to serve as STS sidekicks. Uh, let me return to what the scientists bring to this. They are the ones, first of all, who know the science. There's a fair bit of bad STS, actually, out there, thin cultural studies of science, 
Um, but more than that, the basic scientists know about controversies in the literature, the agonistic character of scientific claims making. They know the theories that have just been overturned. They know about funding pressures, priorities at NIH and NSF. They know about hyping in their own grant proposals to underscore the relevance of their piece of uh, physiologic arcana in the world of disease control. They know about the life cycle of the researcher, when it becomes difficult in one's career to get R01s. Um, they know what it took for them to learn to use a new instrument um, to interpret a new kind of tracing. They know what it takes to produce and sustain the interest they take in science. Curiosity, desire, as Jane put it uh, last night. They know about yearning for recognition, about credit and credibility. They know when a corporate influence has tickled someone's scientific equipoise, perhaps their own, threatened to make them what Jonathan Weiner called last night unreliable narrators. Uh, I'm going to skip over why we're not calling this Elsie, which I see as upstream, uh, downstream, uh, post-translation for the most part, rather than upstream. Um, I'll skip past why I like science, technology, and society, rather than science technology studies uh, in the medical setting. Um, I close. Um, I'll skip past our guest from last week. Uh, now, let me, let me, Lundy Braun, who's a wonderful STS researcher at Brown, a pathologist become historian uh, in Africana Studies in the Brown STS program, uh, came down this week to conduct a terrific discussion for faculty development purposes uh, on, on uh, the case of HPV, cervical cancer, and the Gardasil vaccine. And this happened in happy conjunction with a local effort to develop an HPV case I'm going down, uh, that was uh, thickened along social lines. So we're trying to, to develop that case at home. Among the range of STS dimensions we discussed was that uh, HPV subtypes 16 and 18, the two carcinogenic subtypes targeted by the vaccine, target cancers of the global north. Um, despite the fact that the global ver burden of, H of uh, cervical cancer is borne by the global south. So a simple observation that um, could easily not make it into the scientific presentation of uh, some of these kinds of interventions. Um, let me wind down and say um, there are some political issues with STS. Uh, it can be reappropriated by the um, uh, political right to challenge climate science, evolutionary theory. I mean, there are all kinds of issues. But the tools, I think, are tools of critical thinking, of connoisseurship, of evidence. And I think uh, I'm optimistic we'll be able to put them to good work in, um, in medical school. Thanks. Thank you. So I think we'll hold questions for both speakers after Terry's done. You have no idea how hard it is to talk to people with your feet dangling in the air. I'm going to stand if you want. Um, so I'm. Uh, I, yeah, I changed the title. Sorry. Um, not that it matters. There you go. Okay. Um, <laughs> Stop it. My relationship with technology. Thank you. Um, I, I'm pulling out a um, uh, set of cards I don't play very often. Um, the, um, literary criticism. Uh, when Eileen asked me to come up here and talk about evidence, I I don't know if I said, but I was thinking. But I already spoke about evidence up here. That's all I had to say. Um, so I, uh, but I I thrashed around for a while, and I have something um, rather different. Um, I'd like to consider the meaning of old. As a geriatrician, I come at this question from a particular perspective, struggling from time to time against an irritating assumption, common enough among our colleagues and other specialties, that what geriatricians chiefly do is palliate the passage of the dying. He is the last doctor, the one who signs the death certificate. The geriatrician bristles at this and feels that conflating his work with that of the mortician is a slight. Worse, equating old with dead, is a slight to our patients, who in their sheer liveliness are a continuing source of delight. My patients spend most of their time not in dying, but living. They face, as all of us do, the task of getting through each day in the expectation that there will be a tomorrow. 
How much harder must this task become when one inhabits a culture that thinks of you as already dead? Despite all the news recently about the zombie apocalypse, the distinction between the living and the dead is one of the few absolutes I know. To confuse that distinction, to set a group of people, any group of people, outside the category of the living, has terrifying implications. Old. The word is, well, ancient. Part of the English language, as long as there has been an English in which to speak it. It has its cognates all over Europe, tracing back to Latin alere, nourish, and ultimately to the Proto-Indo-European root al, to grow, nourish. Evidently, originally the old were simply parents, significant insofar as they reared the next generation, after which, like salmon, they were beside the point, needing no epithet other than dead. It was only when old people stuck around long enough to see their role as child rearers taken over by the younger generation that a new terminology became necessary, and old became something else. In Latin, for instance, senex. In Greek, gerios, which is the point at which the word becomes problematic in the way I would like to consider here. We think a senex is demented because dementia, with very few exceptions, happens only to the old. And likewise, by the age of 90 or so, most of us who are lucky enough to live that long can expect to have lost some of our cognitive capacities. This is a material fact, and it seems determinative. Now, I say material fact, knowing that um, the status of fact in this discourse and any discourse is open to debate. It's only in the imagination that facts possess this kind of rhetorical power I'm talking about here. But to think this distinction somehow softens the effect such facts can have is to underestimate the power of the imagination and of rhetoric. The fact, real or imagined, remains stubbornly interfering with well-meaning attempts to imagine old in less disturbing ways, such as our golden years. On the register where words acquire meaning, it doesn't really matter that the vast majority of people over, say, 70 are not demented. The association of aging with dementia sticks because of something stronger than such a broader survey of the facts can argue away. What cements the association? On the crudest terms, and taken in the broader sense for which dementia functions as a synecdoche, as I've been saying in the cultural imagination, old is what happens to you just before dead. There is a powerful tendency to think of life as development, and on this register, dead is not only the immediate result, it is the ultimate effect, the telos, of old. Old imposes dead, and death obliges old, close as damn it. But I think there's something more important going on here than teleology. Not necessarily complicated, but important to understand for what it tells us about the limits of our abilities to control our perceptions, to take our evidence straight and be persuaded by it, no matter what inappropriate conceptual schemes may hedge it in. I'd like to consider, to get at this, the relation between two texts about old. The first is almost as inevitable as death itself in this setting, Shakespeare's King Lear. This will not be on the exam. It's just there to give you something to look at. Lear stands as the supreme expression in English of the power of the myths we tell ourselves about aging, and beyond that, of that absolute quality of the factual in hearing in death. She's gone forever, Lear howls, cradling Cordelia's body in his arms. I know when one is dead and when one lives. She's dead as earth. Thou'lt come no more. Never, 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 never. Two and a half lines later, as if to underscore this absolute finality, Lear joins Cordelia in death. But the moment, interestingly, is obscured, at least on stage, where we can't see that helpful stage direction, he dies. (laughs) On stage, what happens is that Edgar cries out instead. He faints and implores him, look up, my lord. For the climactic moment of a play so invested in death, cushioning the blow in this way is odd. It is especially so in light of the play's other central interest in truth-telling and dissembling, in knowing the difference between what is, such as Cordelia's fidelity or Edgar's or Kent's, and what merely seems, the counterfeit affections of Reagan, Goneril, and Edmund, or Edgar's disguise as Mad Tom, or, more puzzling, his ultimate demonstration of his filial love in leading his father to believe he has jumped from the cliffs of Dover and survived. At this crucial moment, the two themes come into conflict, death being held in suspension 
by uncertainty. The uncertainty is brief. Kent corrects Edgar immediately. But this confusion about Lear's condition is not the only such moment. Lear himself can say about Cordelia in the same line, she's dead as earth and lend me a looking glass. If that her breath will mist or stain the stone, why then she lives. In the brief lines that remain to him after that last wrenching, never, he turns again. Pray you, undo this button. Thank you, sir. Do you see this? Look at her. Look her lips. Look there. Look there. And still calling us to look, Lear dies. Why does Lear die asking us to look? To look, moreover, for signs of a life he has already called forever out of reach. Perhaps for the same reason Kent and Edgar respond to the appearance of this old man carrying Cordelia and declaring her dead as earth with, is this the promised end or image of that horror? What is the difference between the promised end and its image? At this point in the play, it seems another odd distinction to make, but if it is odd, it is an oddness the play goes out of its way to underscore in Lear's uncertainty, in Edgar's, over the one fact that seems as far beyond doubt as it is beyond such distinctions as promised end or its image. Or perhaps not. The editors of the Pelican Shakespeare helpfully gloss the promised end as doomsday. And I think the gloss is, in this case, telling. Because the question, is this the promised end, or image of that horror, actually has an answer. Of course, this isn't doomsday. We're watching a play, the image of that horror. A play, moreover, that is about to reach its promised end. The answer to the question is, of course, both yes and no. This is the kind of quibble Shakespeare could never resist, even at a moment such as this. In making this point, at this moment, the play insists on a quality of theater, of narrative, of representation, that is vital to understanding not only the play's moral universe, but the question we're considering today. Everyone in Lear dissembles. Everyone presents an image that, in its difference from the thing itself, generates the action of the play. Had Regan and Goneril not lied about their loves, had Cordelia not coyed hers, it is difficult to imagine the action proceeding as it does. Deception spares no one. Kent and Edgar are as false in their way as Edmund is in his. Gloucester, in his moral idiocy, is all too willing to, in, to participate in Edmund's lies. Lear fools himself, and the fool dissembles most of all, dressing up his ironic commentary as foolishness. Edgar is a closing apothegm, speak what we feel, not what we ought to say, suggests that these lies all rise out of some tangle of social obligation. This is certainly what trips up Cordelia. And while this is important, the central point on which the curtain falls is still personal integrity in being, not seeming, in knowing and maintaining the crucial distinctions on which life ultimately depends. Confusing what should be kept distinct is fatal. Or is it? If Lear's and Edgar's confusion in the final scene tells us anything, it's that such confusions aren't fatal so much as wishful. And their persistent repetition from both Lear and Edgar, especially Edgar, who in the play's closing speech becomes our access to the truth, suggests that this desperate wishfulness is, at best, very difficult to escape. It is, in fact, stronger than the incontrovertible facts of first Cordelia's and then Lear's deaths. In this final turn from what is to how we come into awareness of it, the play addresses something vital about the relationship between not only truth and deception, but the phenomenological substrate of all such distinctions, the relationship between perception and imagination. This is not, we are reminded, the promised end, but only its image. We're watching a play. The entire illusion ought to come crashing down around our heads at that moment, but of course it does not. We go on, gripped by the spectacle of Lear's suffering, despite everything we know to the contrary about what is and what merely seems. In that moment, it is the seeming that takes on the greater reality, utterly convincing, in no small part because so utterly sad, in part. There's another aspect of Lear's tragedy that complicates our response. Consider, just whose play is Lear? The title suggests that it is Lear's story, but the action tells us otherwise. It is true that Lear's fast intent to shake all cares and business from our age turns out badly. But whose fault is this really? Not every foolish parent necessarily makes himself the object of parasitical lust. At least so I tell my teenage sons. 
Um, it is the young, not the old, who drive the play's action through all the elaborate machinations that begin with Goneril's first speech, Act 1, Scene 1. This essential fact about Lear is important enough that the play reiterates it endlessly and distributes it widely. Cordelia, in hiding her love, dissembles to even worse effect than Regan and Goneril. And Edgar, in conducting his blinded father through a fantasy about his miraculous fall and survival, is given the most elaborate, most stagey role of all. The moral division of truth versus falsehood is, falsehood is carefully mapped not over good and evil, but audience and speaker, old and young. The machinery of this play belongs to the young, explicitly to the children of aged parents shaping events to their own ends. They shape events specifically by shaping perceptions. Regan and Goneril create the perception that Lear is senile. Edmund shapes Gloucester as a traitor, and Edgar convinces his father that he is the miraculous survival, survivor, really, in this play, the greatest deception of all. In Act One, Regan and Goneril tell each other a story about age as foolishness in order to provide an occasion for their treachery. But the audience for this performance is far wider than just the two of them. They shape this narrative with an eye to public perception. That you protect this course, Regan tells her father, and put it on should not scape censure nor the redresses sleep, which in the tender of a wholesome wheel might in their working do you that offense, which else were shame. She's concerned with the common wheel, with society, but the tool she deploys is shame. Children in Lear construct age in terms familiar to all of us, constructed explicitly as public discourse, shameful, needing to be put away, shaping the cultural understanding of old even as they shape the plot. In every aspect of the tale, the old figure is pawns and stories constructed by the knowing young who have in their control not events so much as perceptions. King Lear is very much a story about presentation and perception, about stagecraft and audience, about writing and reading. And it is in this last aspect that it generated more than two centuries after its first performance, a gloss not on the play itself, but on the act of reading the play, almost. This is Keats's sonnet known as On Sitting Down to, King, to Read King Lear Once Again, composed on or about January 23, 1818, when Keats was 22 years old and three years away from death, the poem appears in a letter to his brothers in which he reports, I sat down yesterday to read King Lear once again. The thing appeared to demand the prologue of a sonnet. I wrote it and began to read. And he ends, I know you would like to see it. And so do you. I'm not going to read it to you. You know how to read. I'll give you a minute. And this will be on the exam. The poem begins with a weather report and a command to shut up. It's a wintry day in London, and cloudy, as the third quatrain explains. What the shutting up is about is internally a little obscure, but the language echoes in a number of ways Keats' most celebrated silence upon a peak in Darien. From his first successful poem, in which he characteristically imagines himself falling silent in the face of the poetic tradition. When the end of the second quatrain in the Lear sonnet finally named Shakespeare, we realize we are back in those same realms of gold, except we're not in the same part. We're in hell, surrounded by tokens of the fall of man. It's the same realm, actually, as Chapman's Homer, but the demean we're entering are held not by Homer, but Shakespeare, and most troublingly, Milton, and behind him, Dante. The speaker's prayer, addressed oddly to the bard in London's January murk, is that he not be lost. The barren dream and the adieu have their echoes later in a similar apostrophe to a nightingale and carry here the same burden, a fear of meeting an unproductive dead end, a fear allayed partly by a turn to an image that suggests fantastically, wishfully, the possibility of escape. Escaping traps is the master trope in Keats's work, one we needn't know as biography to find, from sleep and poetry to that undead hand reaching out at us from the two-dimensional prison of the page. But the biography helps. We know, of course, how anxiously this generation regarded Milton, how much more anxious, then, is this poem, which raises the ante from his earlier encounter with Homer to put the speaker up against not only Milton, but Shakespeare and Dante. This sonnet appears at a critical point in Keats's career, the beginning of his Annus Mirabilis, 
Within four months of the date of this poem, he had written all six of the great odes. It's also, however, not long since his endymion had been trashed by Lockhart in Blackwoods as imperturbable driveling idiocy. With Lockhart's advice, so back to the shop, Mr. John, back to plasters, pills, and ointment boxes, still ringing in his ears, Keats had spent much of the previous year revising endymion before giving it up to look for a way to escape the general condemnation of his published work. The charge of idiocy evidently stuck because much of Keats' rumination in this period involves seriousness in one form or another and the difficulty of grafting that quality onto the passionate verse that he understood as his metier. So more than any other poet of his generation, by the time this sonnet appears, Keats was already setting out explicitly to challenge Milton on his own territory with an epic retelling of the fall. It's no wonder he approaches this terrain, the scene of Lear, uneasily. But there is more to the biography than this. In a letter to Benjamin Bailey written the same day as the sonnet, Keats reports, My brother Tom is getting stronger, but his spitting of blood continues. I sat down to read King Lear yesterday and felt the greatness of the thing up to the writing of a sonnet. It is not surprising that a report of Tom's spitting of blood would lead by association to King Lear. But there are other items in Keats's correspondence of the weeks immediately preceding that both widen and specify the association. A month earlier, he had written, I spent Friday evening with Wells and went next morning to see Death on the Pale Horse. It is a wonderful picture when West's age is considered. He was approaching 80. But there is nothing to be intense upon, no woman one feels mad to kiss, no face swelling into reality. The excellence of every art is its intensity, capable of making all disagreeables evaporate from their being in close relationship with beauty and truth. Examine King Lear, and you will find this exemplified throughout. West's death on the pale horse draws its title and subject, of course, from Revelations. The pale horse is traditionally associated with plague, in Keats's time and since, specifically with tuberculosis. Not the promised end, perhaps, not yet, but its image. What King Lear seems to threaten Keats with is simply death, in the form most familiar to Keats at that time, the consumption with which his brother was already burning and which would soon enough consume him as well. Keats writes, however, in anticipation of the event and in a gesture as if to forestall what he knows is waiting for him in that old oak forest. Whether the death he fears is merely of his poetic reputation or his actual death doesn't really matter. The epitaph conflating the two, he described himself as one whose name was writ on water, is his last word on that question. The final image in the sonnet, converting consumption into the fire through which the phoenix finds itself reborn at my desire, underscores what is already implicit in the preceding couplet and in the poem itself, both as text and as gesture. The fire is also still the hectic flush that marked consumption's victims at the stage Tom was passing through at that time. Those phoenix wings seem to offer escape, but they do so in terms that already question the possibility. The image comes directly from that realm of romance he's trying to leave behind, and the phoenix, of course, rises from its own ashes only to burn again in another of those endless cycles of life and death the romantics were so fond of. The poem's last words acknowledge the element of wishfulness in all of this at my desire. Because wishful it is. Confronted with Lear, Keats turns away to write a poem of his own. In fact, one of the most striking features of this poem is how very little it is about Lear and how much it is about Keats, as if to replace the feared image with something more Heimlich. But the poem cannot entirely efface what it fears. This is the fate of all such gestures. The turn away is also inescapably a turn toward. But in that turn, Keats at least allows us to see that what we cannot escape, we may at least understand, which may be all we can know on earth, and may be all we need to know. I offer this as an image of what happens when we read King Lear, when we read old, and perhaps when we ask ourselves if we couldn't somehow separate old from dead. Just as Keats can't see the play as anything but a portent of his own death, and so must rewrite it into his own much happier, if avowedly wishful, autobiography, when we look at old, we cannot help but see it in terms of our own death. There's no escaping the association. The most we can hope for is to know that when we make that association, it is not our elders but our own death we see there. 
It is in our recoil from that impossible image that the whole concatenation of dissembling and recapitulations begins. The abjection that demands old be not us, be something entirely other, death itself above which we must soar, because we, of course, we are not Lear, we are not old. The young Keats, with more reasons to know and to fear death than many other young people, cannot escape this fantasy. But all those reasons also mean that he can name it as a fantasy. We imagine we regard age and death from a safe distance. But in that distance, inevitably, things blur and merge in a collapse at once consoling and terrifying. It is in our refusal to know that what we see in those older than us is a projection of our own mortality, not the accomplishment of theirs that all the damage begins as well to those elders whose lives are diminished and to us in that diminishment that reduces us as well. Thank you. So thank you both for those papers, and I'd love to open the floor up for any questions or comments regarding either of the two. So maybe while we're waiting, if somebody else wants to sort of think a little bit harder, I'll at least begin asking, um, maybe starting with Terry, thinking a little bit more about the title of the panel in relation to your talk. Could you, <laughs> you can. Uh, offer an idea? I mean, there, are, there are, I think I, I sort of imagine a number of ways in which clearly relevant, but how, how did you kind of conceive of the questions of both clinical and humanistic evidence in relationship to rereading both Lear and rereading, rereading Keats. Actually, where this paper comes from is is from a, it's from the most primitive part of it. I really am and have for a long time been bothered by this confusion over the, the impossibility of the word old simply being old. That it, you know, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a troubling conception to think of the, the state of being, which is also a state of not being. Um, but this, this is something that I, I mentioned this to a, a group of my colleagues in my division last week, and they all said, oh, yeah, I hate that. You know, it, it's something that, that bothers us. And I just wanted, you know, it, it's, I was thinking of, you know, in, in very simple terms, the phenomenology of what I do clinically, the, the object that I work with and how it gets objectified. And the rest of it, you know, whenever I, I'm forced to say something, you know, that looks culturally sophisticated about aging, I always, you know, refer to King Lear, even though I have so much trouble reading lines from it in, in, in public. Um, and, um, and the great thing about Lear is that it has this gloss on it. And, you know, in thinking about the relationship between that, that poem and that play, the rest of it just kind of, I was just following their lead. But it, it comes... For me, all evidence, all phenomenology, everything is reducible to language, and that's that's the other bias that that was at play here. Do you have a question? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask, and I think this would be for both of you. If you could speak to some of your thoughts on how do we equip our students in using the humanities to be more reflective, to be able to consider evidence, whether it be narrative evidence, evidence evidence-based medicine, a combination of both, but to be critically reflective, to go in there as professionals, as lifelong learners, how can we articulate the role of humanities in a strong way so that this can make an impact in the curriculum? You first. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, <clears throat> you know, thinking skeptically about evidence is something I actually think um, we do a pretty good job on. Not, you know, it's it's all because of this, the basis Barry lays down, but um, the the kind of training people get in the third year clerkships about how to read skeptically the uh, the clinical literature, I, I think is pretty good. Um, certainly it was when I was a student in the program when evidence-based medicine was, was new on the scene. Um, 
my particular piece of it has much more to do with um, the self-reflexive part um, and how I've gone about that. For the last eight years, I think, I've been teaching a, um, a writing workshop in autobiographical writing for um, second-year medical students who, in our program, by that time, have had about four weeks of clinical experience. Um, and the assignment is simply write about something that, that you were involved in um, as part of the medical care end of the equation. And um, I think it's been very successful in that the students complain that they're spending far more time on it than they intended to. Um, you know, the workshop's a wonderful thing. I mean, the student produces a story, and it's always, you know, kind of half-baked. And by the end of the discussion, they realize that there was a lot more going on in it than they were aware of. Yeah. And that, that's critical, um, realizing that you are not simply what you intend or what you're aware of presenting is... I think the, the the essential first step to actually living a life of, of self reflection. So that's what I do. Um, I, I'm not sure that I mean I, as I said that medical students um, uh, don't have a coherent psychology, and so I don't have a tact a strategy for getting to all of them at once. Um, so I, I've had, I think, m the most success having students over a period of uh, enough weeks to figure out um, a, a, what kind of mix of things to lob at them. So there's some students who want very much to have the compelling example come from within uh, the workday life of biomedicine. So, um, so to take the radiological example, you know, if you can show show them the studies. Radiologists are um, among the most um, uh, attentive people to their own um, perceptive biases, right? They, they, the the inter-observer variability, uh, intra-observer variability um, is an irreducible problem for radiologists. And so they're always, um, I mean, they love it because there's a literature there to be mined, right? And um, they can, computers track their gaze. Um, they... Uh, if you make them read uh, sets of x-rays that are um, enriched versus impoverished with the kind of pathology they're looking for, you will um, change the, um, the, the, the number of, of true positives or false positives you know, that they uh, pick up. So um, they, they know this. And so if you show the, the um, student who wants a clinical example that, then I think you know, if, if what you're trying to get across is that... Um, that the, the beginnings of evidence, which is our powers of perception, are themselves malleable and situated and, and suggestible that, you know, they can get that. Um, other students respond to, um, to um, devices of alienation, things that take them radically out of their present, you know, um, moment. And um, so uh, historical examples or cross-cultural examples of, of different kinds of modes of perception, right, um, can be compelling. And, you know, I think the most effective intervention actually happens before the classroom. Um, our admissions office has done a great job widening the pool. Um, we have a lot of people enrolled in the program now who didn't major in biochemistry, uh, which to my mind should be a, an absolute exclusion from medical school. But, um, you know, the, the more we can get people who have a, a background in the humanities, I think the better we'll be. And studies have shown that, that uh, the bio majors and the humanities majors get pretty much the same score within any st st statistically significant um, difference on the, the licensing exams. So I'm, I'm glad that we're seeing a, a, a shift in that direction because I, I think it really will make a difference. I'll, I'll be a little perverse, too, and say that um, my way in is not via narrative. Um, I, I uh, work in the... Uh, a more kind of capacious category about representation. Um, I'm playing with the term rhetoric now, um, uh, looking, I mean, I'm very interested in the sciences of language and the ways that they exert tractions on our imagination and our ways of knowing, right? But, um, but there are lots and lots of linguistic devices that are not narrative. Uh, dialogue is not intrinsically narrative. Lists aren't narrative. Um, and uh, so there are many, many um, linguistic devices that um, we can explore to find ways. Of, yeah. In the first row. Um, uh, Barry and Terry, uh, it's a shame I have to come all the way to New York to hear you talk. I run into you every day. 
the building. <laughs> Wonderful talks. Um, I have a question that uh, is kind of simplistic based on what you have just said, but, um, but in thinking about Sackett's three dimensions of evidence, of uh, evidence from the liter from research, evidence from the client or patient, and evidence from the clinician's um, experience, where do you situate the humanities knowledge? Uh, do you put it within each of those? Or if you were to create a model that would show like how those things work together in the clinical reasoning process, um, how would that look? You know, I have such a polyglot heterodox notion of the humanities that um, it's hard to answer. So uh, if you go with Gianna's presentation yesterday of uh, a case series, right, um, and you're working within Renaissance operations of similarity, um, you need a big archive, right? And, and so um, there's this imaginary of an archive. And um, so I... I mean, there, there are associations with those upper levels of Sackett's hierarchy of evidence there, right? It's um, uh, the judgments of similarity are profoundly personal, but there's an archival um, operation that's up that hierarchy somewhere. So I, I don't know that, I mean, I would, I feel as if you're wanting me to insert humanities inquiry there at the base where experience works and, and tact and judgment, and, and, but, and certainly there's lots and lots to say about that, but. I guess my thought is more around how can we, we sh structure explaining these relationships in ways wow. that will help this um, kind of union of the two grow and, and be understood, uh, ways to uh, maybe not put boundaries on it, but to kind of arrange these different sources of evidence and legitimizing humanities as a key source of evidence. Okay. This was either a really bad or a really good question. No, no, it's probably... <laughs> no, it's, it's really good. It's, it's a terrific question. Than, um, it's just a... Uh, um, you know, Sue... So, you're addressing directly about the sequestration of your evidence yeah. bars away from the rest of the group. Yeah. Right. I, mean, I think another way to approach it is to imagine how the humanities can alter the kinds of questions that we're asking in our evidence-based literature. Uh, you know, what kinds of priorities and values matter for a research agenda? So it, it's not necessarily important to see what is happening to A1C levels, but maybe what's happening to something that matters, time spent out of a hospital, um, you know, time spent with someone else, things like that. We'd have to just change the notion of what we were studying, not so much biomedical outcomes, but maybe other kinds of priorities and values. Um, I think you had a question. Well, I, 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 this has been very interesting. And I, but there's a, 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 a cultural background over the last 50 years of which, against which what you're discussing is being played out. We were much more interesting in the 50s, in the 1950s, much more interesting. We had depth. We had an unconscious. We had really a uh, subjectivity that was honored. People talked about it all the time. Everybody knew who Freud was and Horney and all of those people. I mean everybody. I mean everybody, not mm -hmm. just <coughs> the cognoscenti. But, and, but then over that period of time, shortly after that, it began to disappear. Well, one thing I say, where did the unconscious go? Where is that? Horror Nobody films. Nobody talks about it anymore. <laughs> now, leaving apart the fact that uh, cognitive and behavioral therapy is much cheaper, leaving that apart, uh, what, what happened to all the therapies? They just, hmm. Now, that's interesting because at the same time as that was happening, what we're discussing here, the humanities and so forth, was gaining strength. And it has gained strength very slowly, but it's gained strength mm -hmm. through this same 50 years. But something else has happened. And that is the, 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 the worldview of science has gotten progressively more powerful in the, not just in medicine, which we understand that, but in through the whole society. You think the words evidence-based is only in medicine? It's in teaching uh, young child education. Uh, 
And it isn't the teacher that counts, it's the method that counts. Just like in medicine, it isn't the doctor, it's the knowledge. The knowledge. And so here are these two things that have been going on at the same time, except at the present time, science, uh, the worldview of science and the linear thought of science is more powerful than it has ever been. And it pervades the entire culture. At the same time that its model of medicine, which was the knowledge does the treatment, has been a failure. Evidence-based medicine is, on any objective measure, a failure. It doesn't take care of people. And the evidence gets much more, you know, up here somewhere. It gets further and further from the patient. So that I think when you're talking about these things, you have to see that you're trying to teach students to be more reflective and to be more understanding about evidence at a time when the whole culture believes that evidence and so forth. You got the point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have to take exception um, about evidence-based medicine. I don't think it's been a failure. I think it can easily be, be misapplied, but um, something I like to tell the medical students because it makes them crazy is just because it's possible to do something badly doesn't mean you shouldn't try to do it. Um, I think evidence-based medicine has made things a lot better in a lot of ways in terms of avoiding um, a, an unthinking reliance on traditional methods. I think it's, it's, it's helped inculcate an attitude of skepticism. It can also help inculcate a lot of other things, but again, I think when done well, I think it's, it's very salutary. I think Dr. Saunders was the one to point out that maybe, depending on the evidence, didn't start uh, with our friends from uh, McMaster's. Maybe, depending on the evidence, goes back quite a way. It's true that when I was young and a just beginning practicing physician, I was at a meeting in the Medical Society of New York City. In those days, we were afraid of the Medical Society, which is impossible to believe. But we were, and this young man said, was talking about uh, oreomycin, whose name, one of the tetracyclines, and he was talking about how he liked it for some thing. I mean, like he would talk about a, a, a spice or a, a mm -hmm. new flavor. And, uh, and that, that's gone. That kind of ridiculous talk is gone. But it's been gone for a very long time. Evidence did not start with evidence-based medicine. And the evidence-based medicine has gotten further and further away from the patient because it depends on studies which require a lot of, of subjects. And to get a lot of subjects, you've got to smooth out the differences. And once you start smoothing out the differences, you start smoothing out the patients. Um, it's possible to misuse statistics as well. And we do that all the time when we tell a patient you have a 30% chance of being cured by this treatment. I mean, that's just, any doctor who says that should be taken out and given that treatment himself. Um, but, you know, you talk about the 50s. I was a product of the 50s. I think you're right. We were much more interesting back then. But um, I, I've looked at the Materia Medica from 1950. They had nothing. Treatment for an MI was light diet, bed rest, and oxygen. No, no you're mistaking. You're mistaking. I think we are capable. I think we are capable of. in bed for six weeks, too. I think we are capable of getting people through illnesses that would have killed them. People are living longer and living longer more healthily. Okay. Now, that's not the whole story, but if you don't get that chapter told, the rest of it doesn't happen. I, I agree with you that, that an overweening emphasis on the numerical has impoverished us. It's not the whole story, but it's an essential part of it. I would not go back to the days before the Cochrane Review and things like that. For you know, I, I would be doing a disservice to my patients to ignore the work that's come out of that, that area of study. So I think there's definitely a discussion that's going on in, in medicine today. I mean, the, the, the question and the role and the value of the, the EBM, and, and it's going to sort of continue to become a hot topic. I'd like to take just one more question before we switch off, and I'd also like to invite Rachel, who's going to be our um, poetic reader for the next session, up to the front. This is for Dr. Saunders, I think, and it follows on the past two, but I had formulated it before. I'm a little surprised that at the top of your pyramid 
are these Cochrane reviews. Uh, a couple of them I've looked at could in no way be said to be without bias. These happen to be on drugs. And depended on incomplete information because of trade secrets at the FDA. And um, one also heard 20 years ago a lot about cookbook medicine. And of course today we're hearing about cost. So I wondered, first of all, why Cochrane was at the top of the pyramid and just how it's interacting in, or what you predict will be the interactions in whatever's happening in medicine in the next several years. So um, why is Cochrane at the top of the period, uh, pyramid? Um, uh, can't Cochrane be wrong? Um, and what's ahead? Uh, I, the slide with the Cochrane vol the volumes, evidence-based medicine, and a pyramid there, that's just uh, showing what's out there. I, I'm not endorsing um, the pyramid as such. I think um, there are uh, lots of things that are lost in meta-analyses. Uh, there are things that are missed in randomized controlled trials. There is a historicity of the randomized controlled trial that's rarely told in medical school settings. Um, uh, so... Uh, and as Dr. Cassell rightly points out, we, um, we, we don't know what uh, dimensions of relevant particularity are erased by, by um, aggregating studies like those. So, um, and there are all kinds of uh, modes of obfuscation of, um, of evidence in, in, uh, uh, in, in even well-run studies. So I, I um, don't take that as my, you know, endorsement of, of I'm, I'm really uh, applying what I think is a multi-pronged critique of a multiple, a, a multiplex deployment of the term and notion of evidence in medical education. I don't think we, when we say evidence, we just mean Cochrane Review. Um, I don't think the way in is just via the um, experience and tact of the, uh, pers the physician who attends to particulars. I think the critique comes from a lot of different angles, and some of them come from science technology studies, which some of you might perceive as outside the purview of the medical humanities. But for me, I can't do without it, um, and uh, with, without the work of historians, social st scientists, um, anthropologists and sociologists of science, philosophers of science. Um, so... Uh, I don't know if that helps. Now, what's ahead? Uh, you know, cookbook medicine, you reminded me of the Gawandi Cheesecake Factory essay, right? I mean, I think um, he's probably right. We're probably looking at a corporatized, um, uh, you know, streamlined recipes and um, standardized uh, cares and from which, st protocols from which you deviate at some peril. And... Um, uh, I, I think those are forces to be resisted. I think Gawande's wrong about many things. Um, and uh, so, um, gosh, I'm on tape, aren't I? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it's um, extraordinarily uh, eloquent and insightful person. But I, I, um, I think if we're going to, I mean, the, for instance, um, there's an argument that we're done with the era of craft and the guild. Uh, and I think it's empirically wrong. We've got plenty of guild sociality all around us. We're not done with it. And we're, not, we're, gonna, it's, we, we're still going to need craft traditions of apprenticeship to learn how to use the new black box in the corner. So um, there will be recipes, but, um, but we, we'll have a connoisseurship of craft and tact and um, personal knowledge, you know, for as long as any of us are there to get doctored. Yes, we fall back on terms like connoisseurship and tact for a real good reason, and I'm happy to do so because that's where the humanities lives. Um, I'm reminded of Jonathan Weiner's, I thought, wonderful response to that really unfair question I asked him yesterday about reliable narrators. Of course, there's no such thing, and we get into trouble thinking that there ought to be one. We do the best we can. You know, certainly evidence can be abused. Certain, you know, certainly the Cochrane reviews can be wrong. But you know, people of abilities and with good faith trying to know what's you know, 
how to do the best they can do is what really all of our lives rely on. You know, I'm getting in an airplane tomorrow. I sure as hell hope the engineers at the you know airport were thinking that way, and they probably were. You know. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Barry, and thank you, Terry.